Jamie Dimon is one of the most prominent and distinguished CEOs in the global economy. He has successfully commanded the helm of JP Morgan Chase since 2005, steering the vast financial institution into becoming the largest non-state owned bank in the world. The CEO, worth about $1.7 billion right now, is not only a superstar in the executive space of finance, but is also in his understanding of macroeconomics. Case in point, he steered JP Morgan through the 2008 financial crisis with relative ease, a trend he has seemingly continued through the ongoing COVID-19 recession and the turmoil that followed. Combining his extensive expertise in macroeconomics with his access of cutting edge research data that we cannot possibly even fathom, and that tells us that whether you hate, dislike, perhaps even love him when he speaks, we ought to listen. Obviously, we must not be fooled into believing that he doesn't have an agenda behind every Thing he says in public, but it would be equally unwise as to ignore everything he says solely down to our personal feelings towards him, as this will likely cost us vast quantities of money on our investments in the long run. Firstly, on the 22nd of May 2022, at JP Morgan Chase's Investor Day, Jamie Dimon granted upon us a first hint of a prolonged period of economic uncertainty and hardship in his address to investors, where he spoke of a strong economy but big storm clouds, with a later specification about his usage of the word storm clouds where he states, I'm calling it storm clouds because they're storm clouds they may dissipate. Now whilst many could ignore this warning outright given Damon's insistence that there is potential for a false alarm where the clouds may dissipate, just a week and a half later after his first hint in an address to a financial conference in New York filled with investors, media makers, policy makers and financial analysts, Damon doubled down on his warning instead. He said there's storm clouds, there are big storm clouds, there. it's a hurricane. It's we, right now. It's kind of sunny. Things are doing fine. You know, everyone thinks the, the Fed can handle this. That hurricane is right out there down the road coming our way. We just don't know if it's a minor one or Superstorm Sandy or uh, yeah, Sandy or or uh, Andrew or something like that. And it's you, you better brace yourself. So JP Moore is bracing ourselves and we're going to be very conservative in our balance sheet on you know, with all this capital uncertainty, we're going to have to take actions. And you know, I kind of want to shed non non operating deposits again, which we can do in size, you know, to protect ourselves so we can serve clients in bad times. And so that, that's the environment we're dealing with. Finally, the message could be heard loud and clear. JP Morgan is preparing for the storm and so should you. But why would Jamie Dimon tell the world that he believes the economy is likely to take a hit? Couldn't it start a bank run and cause the issue that he warns of to start prematurely? Why does Jamie Dimon even believe that the economy is about to be hit by this hurricane in the first place? How serious must it be for JP Morgan to adjust its current strategy so heavily? This video is going to explain why Jamie Dimon and JP Morgan has this out look so that you can make the best possible decisions for your investments. Right now, the consensus on the economy is largely positive. Consumer spending has been rising, with spending increasing by 7% to 9% more than in the year prior and 23% more than pre-COVID-19. According to Jamie Dimon himself, in a letter to shareholders released on the 4th of April this year, which also estimated that consumers have an additional $1.2 trillion more excess cash in their checking accounts than before the pandemic. This increase in consumer consumer wealth and spending has led most people to believe that all is well in the economy, with unemployment figures remaining at 3.7%, lower than the long-term average of 5.7% and the all-time high of 14.7% in April of 2020. That's as well as US employers adding 250,000 jobs in April, a far 40% above market predictions from economists who expected the addition of only 180,000 jobs over that same month. All of this suggests that the job market is strong in the United United States, backed by wage inflation which increased to 6.1% in April of 2023 and beat the Consumer Price Inflation Growth CPI which sat at 4.9% in April. Essentially from the perspective of those who only follow Bloomberg, CNBC or other legacy media, the economy is performing incredibly well and there's nothing at all to worry about. But you see, this is only a fake facade. The fall of massive financial institutions like SVB and Credit Suisse have in the words of Jamie Dimon significantly changed the market 
market's expectations with the market's odds of a recession having actually increased. Real CPI is actually higher than one would expect from headline inflation data with necessities like food inflating 6.7% over the year and shelter up 8% with transportation up 11% all which are far above the US wage growth that we actually see each year. Simply put, despite the strength in the job market, if inflation is high then the market wage growth needs to grow equally to combat the rise in consumer costs which as a result in increased production costs and therefore consumer costs causing more inflation. This is occurring in the US economy right now, just at a slower pace due to the lagging of wage growth. I must stress this issue is not going to dissipate quickly and will only stop if and as the Fed continuously hike interest rates, which will in turn halt the economy by causing a mass drop in consumer spending. But now that we've addressed the state of the economy today, we can finally delve into Jamie Dimon's predictions and why he forecasts an economic hurricane. Dimon's also recently come around to early opportunities like the fintech platform played for example. An interesting bit of information except those pre-market opportunities are often outside of our reach. However, this lack of access isn't the case everywhere. There's an investment opportunity we can already access that's actually structured like an IPO in a growing market that's now past its pre-pandemic highs. In fact, plenty of you have already used this special access thanks to our longtime partner, Masterworks. Their offerings in multi-million dollar works of contemporary art are structured like IPOs, just with a different structure for payouts and generating alpha. When a painting sells, you get an annualized net return and a range of Masterworks recent returns include 10, 13, and even 35% net. Masterworks' collection is constantly growing because the billionaires haven't yet bought it all up. The global value of art is expected to grow an incredible $1 trillion by 2026, according to Citibank, which means there's still time for everyday investors. And now it's easy. You can use their website and app like I've been talking about forever. Now each of Masterworks 13 exits so far have returned a profit to investors with several sales already this year. Paintings can even sell out in hours, not days. But right now you can get priority access to skip the waitlist below. Recently, Diamond has been given some major hints as to his uncertainty in the economy in 2023. I'm hoping it will resolve you know, rather shortly. You're hoping. But hoping, yeah. But is the crisis over? You wrote in your letter there will be repercussions for years to come. Well, that's, that's different. I think th those repercussions are regulatory. Like, think, and you know, I acknowledge, think, obviously when you have a problem, things need to change. Just minutes after this display of stuttering and fumbling, a suggestion of Jamie's internal search to find a more pleasant answer, he contradicts himself in this acknowledgement of a problem in the system by claiming that the banking crisis was based on individual issues unique to those banks. The only difference, the only real difference was we call concentrated clients. So Silicon Valley Bank had, you know, a handful of people controlled 35,000 corporate accounts and they just left, you know, $140 billion or something over a course of, a course of two days. That's not happening to other regional banks. Well, they don't have that issue, nor do they have all these other issues. So it's only a handful that are, that are much off sides. But Diamond had no answer for why First Republic fell, a firm which didn't have this concentrated client problem and which JP Morgan first attempted to save before agreeing to acquire all of its $104 billion of a deposit and the majority of its $230 billion in assets. What's going on with First Republic? I mean, you led the effort to swoop in $30 billion from you and your fellow banks to try to steady First Republic. Yeah. And you've acknowledged we don't even know yet if that worked. Yeah, so that was an attempt to try to resolve, help give them time to resolve a situation. We represent them, so I really can't talk about any more than that. And we hope it resolves one way or another. Is it possible that Jamie is hiding something? Why else is he fumbling so hard on this world stage? Here we see one of the most powerful bankers in the world being hit with questions he does not want to answer, something we can give motive to from his explanation that what banks really want to do is avoid the domino effect which occurs when you have a bank run. That's something that he could inadvertently cause in one of these interviews if he were to reveal too much and be bluntly truthful about the current crisis in the financial industry and the world's economy. Knowing that Jamie is being cautious with what he reveals as to not cause a domino effect, we can see him subtly reveal his beliefs by his use of language which portrays uncertainty, something which he would not have to do given a positive outlook. Earlier, he hoped the crisis would be resolved, and later when the interviewer asked, do you expect more banks to fail this year? His response was more simply, I don't know. Despite Diamond's avoidance in fully addressing this close-to-home banking crisis, he also talks on the continuing rising in rates of interest 
by the Fed as acting as the tide going out for borrowers in the sovereign and corporate bond markets, drawing reference to his close friend Buffett's quote that only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. Be prepared for higher rates. I don't know that's going to happen, but be prepared be so you're prepared. not in that tide. So, you know, to me, yes, you have a chance that long rates will be going up and people might get used to higher for longer. If we're to believe what Diamond is saying, that interest rates will stay higher for longer, we can tell for sure that there will be a pull from capital away from the stock market and equities on the whole. But to add to that pressure, the student loan pause is set to end soon after more than three years of COVID-19 relief efforts, with federal student loan borrowers having to resume payments on the 30th of August after the Supreme Court ruled it unconstitutional on June the 30th. An event which will cause 43 million college graduates borrowers to have to rethink their finances and curb spending to pay back the collective trillion in student loan debt owed. On a micro scale, it will cause a drop in consumer wealth by $4,800 per year based on the average monthly payments of $400 and that's for over 43 million Americans. How could it get worse for consumer spending? Well, this isn't the only debt which has been building up for the American public. According to the latest consumer debt data from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, Americans' total credit card balance is $986 billion in the first quarter of 2023, unchanged from the fourth quarter of 2022's record number, leaving the balance the highest since the New York actually began tracking back in 1999. Another figure which is incredibly dangerous is the delinquency data from the Fed and its true concerning. The 30-day delinquency rate or percentage of total outstanding credit card balances currently at 30 days overdue has risen from 2.25 to 2.43% in the first quarter of 2023 following six straight quarters of increases. That means every month for the last year and a half, people have been defaulting on more and more of their credit card debt at the exact same time as the amount of that credit card debt is increasing. Now, I could go on and on about all the various loan types and how all of their delinquency rates are on the rise, but in short, debt is on the rise on the whole and its expiry date is fast approaching. It needs to be repaid and pauses on debt and relief loans of the COVID-19 pandemic are over. People will not and cannot continue to ignore this reality forever. They are about to become much, much poorer and will continue to be so for as long as they continue to spend as they have been. The economy is bloated beyond proportion and it needs to slim. Almost $2 trillion in securities needs to be absorbed by the US markets to return to normality and to do so, there has to be a massive switch. And when this switch finally happens, everything will fall apart very quickly, which is why it's so important to take action before it actually occurs. If you want to protect your investments from this chaos, check out this video's sponsor, Masterworks, or if you want to watch the chaos that BlackRock has been getting themselves into, then watch this video here.